train of thought. I wonder, would you say that we currently live in a more enchanted world or do you think technology works against that kind of mysticism? And in some case, it, it even works against logic and reason. I think we're in a valley of disenchantment or, or which might be the same as saying we don't realize how enchanted we are. Right. I think there was a period when we were growing up, say the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, when the enchantment was more palpable, right? At least from the consumer, you know, I've never worked in tech per se. So like from the consumer's point of view, you know, there was the excitement about the next generation of, you know, the game system or the next generation of the camera was going to have better graphics and, it was, you know, better sound and more storage and, you know, it would be more immersive and, you could interface with more people. And there was an excitement that like uh, things that felt increasingly magical were coming out and that you wanted to keep up with it. And, you know, when the first iPhones were out, there was a sense that, you know, you could feel this, this kind of trembling excitement around like, what, what is this device? And I think it felt magical. And I think now we've entered a kind of desert of cynicism where most people's attitude toward these devices, maybe rightly so, right? But their attitude toward them is pretty negative and they feel like they're just, you know, distractions and addictions taking away from a real world that might actually not be there, right? Or our sense that there's something outside of it might be more of a fantasy than we like to admit, but it's all connected, right? I think like there's a feeling of loss rather than gain has defined the 2010s and early 2020s in terms of tech. I think that's, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, one of the things that come to my mind is that maybe it is that the world seems more occult, but it also feels less weird than it used to because so much of what we're getting from the enchantment of technology is just another system and it's another sense of optimization. And what's interesting is that like through the optimization of technology, we're supposed to be saving our most valuable resource, which is time. But we're actually just creating these like these feedback loops or we actually never have enough time to be immersed in things that are meaningful or that are like a little bit harder to categorize by chronological time. So I'm thinking about like books and art Instead of that, we just have more systems. Yeah, and more, I mean, it makes me think of, do you know the German artist uh, Hito Steierl? Of course, yeah. Yeah, she, she's really fascinating. She wrote this book, I guess they, they must have been separate essays, but they came out in this book called Duty Free Art. Mm -hmm. she, has, she has this great concept of what she calls junk time, you know, which defines a lot of this type of time of being stuck in a loop and struggling to optimize in a way that you know you can't. You know, so junk time is like, you know, I have half an hour free. Do I try to catch up on six emails or do I watch, you know, one episode of some show or do I read four pages of this book while checking my phone and whatever, you know, and the idea that on some level it's true that we have more time, certainly than, you know, people in another century would have in, in a meaningful way. You know, it's important that we're not you know, spending half the day getting water, or trying to wash our clothes, or, you know, that's a real thing. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. right. But, but the sort of tragedy of it is that it's turned into this kind of junk time where it's like halfway between free time and on the clock time, you, you know, and, and I think more and more, I view it as a moral principle, at least for myself and the way I audit my own life of trying to become cognizant of when I'm in this like cul-de-sac of junk time and minimize, I don't think you can ever escape it, but trying to minimize it and saying, you know, I have this half an hour, I really am going to just like take a walk or I'm going to just read this one book and not, you know, also try to catch up on seven things, you know, and I hate that feeling when you're, you know, there's some kind of low level and often <laughs> low paying obligation that you kind of have to get to, but it's not that urgent and it's not that interesting. So you're kind of you know, everyone has this experience. I think we are like sitting with your laptop there and you have like seven tabs open that you're kind of reading and, you know, you're like, well, I really should be doing this one thing, but I'm not engaged in it enough to just do it. So I'm going to also, you know, read these, like now that the year is ending, you know, I always get addicted to like best of lists. And even that, you know, has the sense of obligation of like, you know, best albums of the year and best movies of the year, yeah, and best yeah. books of the year, which is based on genuine excitement. I mean, the sad thing about it is like, I am truly excited. Like I want to see what 
you know, what things have I missed this year and what is out there that I might be excited about, but it right. often manifests itself in this grim sense of just catching <laughs> up, and just adding to your queue and like, how am I going to get through this? Right, right. right. And, and, and it really leaves you with an actual sense of joy or, or, or excitement. I mean, it really makes me think about the Greek idea of Kronos and Kairos and Kronos being like time that can be measured and counted while Kairos is something that's like lived and experienced, which is like, say you're watching a movie, it's obviously about 90 minutes to 120 minutes, depending on the movie, but you're not only spending time sitting in front of the screen, but your mind is like experiencing it and it is stretching time and it's something that will carry over into another time. And you know what I mean? Like it, it becomes like this infinite room of doors and possibilities, which I think is a, a an apt <laughs> description for today's guest, Blake Butler. But I do wonder, like, what would you say is the primary difference between the idea of looking for refuge in art and then looking for escape in terms of how we experience it. And, and those two may be connected, right? Because it's like you're looking to escape into a refuge. You know, you're mm -hmm. looking for something that shocks you out of whatever this, I, I like this idea of junk time, right? Yeah, right. Out, out of junk time. Out of, uh-huh. Yeah. And maybe that means that goes I don't know if it's from Kronos to Kairos or vice versa, but it's like it fuses them in a way, right? Something that, you know, that the 90 minutes that you spend reading, say, say one of Blake Butler's books or, or having a real conversation, you know, with one person or, or a few people rather than drifting among these kind of endless side conversations, you know, like the time that you spend doing that leads somewhere, not necessarily in the sense of attainment that you have to like get something out of it, but like leads somewhere in in the sense that like you actually feel that you're moving deeper into consciousness you know and that there's this refuge that, that may be a horrible place like i don't know that a refuge has to be a good thing or or has to be a pleasant thing but i think it's always a good thing in the sense that it's a real thing at least yeah and it feels like you know a world within the world it feels like some right. place that's here but that we're somehow distracted from or abstracted from and we're always trying to get back to you know that's almost like the feeling of being homeless you know spiritually homeless in the world that like you're at home but it's not your home and something has to make it your home again right but even i think in, within that analogy of spirituality which i agree with but it's still something that you're constantly cultivating you know what i mean like it's not like you're in a spiritual journey or you're in a artistic pursuit and there's a sense of junk time or a sense of completion or a sense of like, if I just do this, I'll get to the end of it. I think maybe this is what leads us to experiencing life to the fullest is that you can somehow manage despite all your obligations and day-to-day -day life to kind of stay within that place where, like you said, that you know, your escape is your refuge and the time spent there is time spent cultivating not only you, but something deeper than yourself, which is, if anything, a deeper connection you have to other people. It's not just like a purely aesthetic thing. I mean, maybe also you could say that focusing just on yourself is related to junk time, right? It's related to narcissism and instant gratification, which is obviously what all of these digital distractions play on right and the desire to you know see where your avatar stands and how many points it's getting in this in this kind of low level game and the deeper sense of refuge is the sense that you are more than you think you are you know to me this relates to the idea of the uncanny right it's the idea that there's something or someone in you that both is you at your deepest level but also feels like it isn't you, it feels like a ghost or like some stranger that's possessing you. And I think real art, maybe especially in the horror genre, can get there, or can remind you of that, right? Or can make you feel this sense of recognizing something that is nevertheless shocking or that seems like it should be unrecognizable, but some part of you recognizes it. And it's like when that thing comes awake, you come alive. Yeah, and it's funny that you bring up the genre of horror because this is something I thought about quite a bit after speaking to Blake because I have to say like 
horror is not my main genre. I think a lot of people <laughs> assume that it is, but there's something about it that just doesn't always gel for me. Like for some reason, it never feels like it's done with enough rigor, elegance, or precision. But occasionally there's projects like one of the books that we referenced quite a few times within our conversation with Blake Butler. It's a book that he wrote called 300 Million. And I guess if I had to like summarize this book, it brings to mind movies like Hellraiser, The House That Jack Built, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street combined with like the, the tortured inner world of a school shooter, John Wayne Gacy and various cults. And I guess to just give a little bit more context, because this book comes up quite a bit, there's two parallel narratives in the book. One is from the mind of Gravy, who is this like omniscient serial killer. He's almost like more of an atmosphere and a presence than like a person or a ghost. And those sections are very like lyrical and visceral and just really dense and just totally immersive. And then there's another part of the book that comes from the journals of this detective named Flood, who's trying to piece together like all of this insanity. Not only do I love that this kind of book is something that's just so, you know, it takes so much discipline to create something as elegant and precise as this, but it also brings you closer into the horror in such a way that I'm not just watching like a slasher movie where somebody's mowing people down. And for me, the excitement is that like, I ideally feel the catharsis of watching someone die in like a, a really creative or graphic way. It's going further back into what you were talking about in terms of the essence or finding your own essence and learning what not only are your limitations, but what, how do you transgress your limitations in such a way that you're actually learning something deeper about yourself, about art, about whatever, a, a spiritual practice, about creativity? And I, I do wish more horror did that, but I feel like a lot of times you have to almost superimpose that kind of lens onto the horror genre. Yeah, and maybe I, I should say horror as a mode rather than a genre. You know, the things that are mm -hmm. shelved under horror in the bookstore maybe do, I mean, there are great things in there, but but maybe as a rule, do a kind of fan service, you know, or, or like package these feelings in a certain way. Whereas the kind of horror that I think we're both interested in and that Blake certainly is interested in is like the exception to that rule. You know what I mean? And is playing with those feelings, but exploding them and putting them in a more not, not just a more literary or, or like high art context, but a more vicious context in the sense that it's like really getting at you in a way, you know, it's not constrained by the expectations of a genre. Right, right. And then how would you explain, this is another book of his that we talk about, but and this is his latest book called Alice Not, which I, I guess I wouldn't say this one is a horror, but it definitely keeps in line with what I think of Blake Butler's books, which is that they're just hypnotizing, visceral, immersive. And I think there's a sense of madness to his writing style that comes from the discipline and obsession, which I think Alice not is or does very well. But why don't you give the listeners a little bit more uh, context around that one? Absolutely. I mean, they're definitely products of obsession you know it's almost like obsession is the theme that is then played out in different rules you know and i know blake really likes uh games and systems and you know computational ideas and has a background in computer science so i think playing through obsessions with different sets of reference gets at his process in a way and, and it made me think also uh you know i know he's very influenced by william burroughs who we've talked about on here a lot and is often seen as a kind of heir to Burroughs in some ways, you know, and I think he does something related to that, but updated for the 21st century of both exploding language, you know, and using English, especially this like very vernacular American English in this incantatory way, or like turning it into a kind of madness that has this insidious quality of like eating away at your sense of sanity. And also in terms of images and, and points of reference, working with this like degraded American landscape, 
you know, which yeah. relates to, to seediness, which we talk about a lot also, but this sense of, you know, ordinary America of, you know, strip malls and chain stores and suburbs and, you know, like you were talking about school shootings and these kinds of just like hyper banal aspects of America, but dripping into some frenetic ultra violence the, the way Burroughs certainly would. Uh, and I think in terms of Alice Knott, the way that Blake's books are always trying to explode language into something shocking or something that can kind of wake you up to some deeper potential. Alice Knott is really about exploding art, right? So, you know, the narrative of the book, without giving too much away, involves a viral spate of filmed destructions and desecrations of famous works of modern art. Right. So there's these like viral videos of people, you know, slashing to Coonings or Jasper Johns or these, you know, Agnes Martin and like these very famous 20th century artists. And the title character of Alice Nod is this heiress who owns a lot of this art in this kind of labyrinthine mansion, almost like a castle. Uh, and she becomes wrapped up in this, it's not exactly a conspiracy, but this like uh, ritualistic mind virus slash almost celebration of glorified destruction of these like extremely valuable, at least in a monetary sense, works of art, you know, and it really gets at the sense of, is there some deeper spiritual value in these kind of inert works that, you know, represent like frozen economic value, you know, frozen on the wall in a museum or in the vault of this extremely wealthy character. And I think it starts to ask these questions of, you know, is there something being freed through the destruction of them? Almost the way that, you know, a lot of myths, or if you think of, you know, a picture of Dorian Gray or something like that, but there's this mythic sense of some kind of spirit being preserved in a painting, right? So I think Alice Knott gets at this feeling of, you know, what if you destroyed it and, you know, stabbed it or covered it with paint or, you know, there's all kinds of destruction, you know, more paint, like all kinds of destructions that happen in the novel or instagrammed it <laughs> he doesn't talk about that in the book but uh <laughs> I, I don't think we intended for this to to loop back around on itself but it does seem like there is something about technology especially that specific platform that does something very similar to what this book does in terms yeah. of like leeching the essence out of art I mean I do wonder if people you know, you know, when you go to a museum now, you're allowed to take photos of the art. And I remember there was a time where you couldn't do that. And now you can just post it. And I know a lot of people will not go to a museum because they've already seen the images from the show and they, it's enough for them. And it's been proliferated past the platform onto whatever, onto other platforms. And it just kind of becomes part of the consciousness and zeitgeist, yet you've never seen the actual piece that's potentially in your town or was in your town where you could have stood in front of it and taken on its essence or whatever the experience of looking at art is for you. Uh, it, it's just kind of funny that uh, it, it does seem to kind of tie into that idea. And it's almost coming full circle that, you know, if you think of those early 20th century pieces like uh, Walter Benjamin's The uh, Work of Art in the Asian Mechanical Reproduction and Adorno wrote about this and, you know, the sense of what is being lost when art is mechanically reproduced, you know, through film or through photography, as opposed to being a singular painting, uh, you know, and then we had the whole 20th century and postmodernism that was playing with those ideas and almost mocking them in different ways. Yeah. Andy Warhol like made his entire uh, essence as an artist about this idea. Yeah. Like a copy of a copy or poetry mm -hmm. art had this, you know, described Disneyland as a, copy without an original, right? And like all this stuff. And I think <laughs> part of what's really interesting now, and it may be scary, but you have to take some interest in it, is that we're like, uh, of people who were born in, in say the 80s and 90s or 70s, 80s and 90s, we, our starting point was the ending point for those kinds of figures, right? So it's like, we're standing on their shoulders. So for us, it's almost like the idea of a copy without an original, you know, we can understand as a historical idea, but isn't even our first order experience. Like we've gone so far into the simulacrum and into the fake that, you know, I know Blake is interested in NFTs also, that it's like, we're, it's coming totally full circle that we're now trying to make the digital unique again, right? It's like some strange continuation of this anxiety about, you know, what is unique versus what is 
infinitely reproducible, which in a sense maybe takes us back to what we were saying about time. You know, and, and I think, you know, when I think about Blake's obsessive, both, both like the power of obsession that he puts into the writing and that it demands of a reader, you know, it really centers on this idea of attention. And I think attention is related to prayer and to meditation, right? In the, in the sense that you could define attention as being consciously investing your time, right? And saying, you know, I'm not going to live in junk time and I'm not going to answer 100 emails at, one, at once. I'm just going to read Alice Not or just going to read 300 million or, or any other book and, you know, really put this deep religious intensity into it or, or into your own writing practice or any kind of art making practice. But I almost think that it's, you know, we've talked before about this idea of a post-secular age, right? But I think as we look into the moment that we're in now coming out of postmodernism, you know, and going beyond what people like Baudrillard or even DeLillo and those kinds of figures could tell us, you know, as we enter something like past what they could see, it almost feels like we're returning to a kind of medieval monastic ideal. I don't know if we're activating that, but I think a lot of people have this desire to deepen rather than broaden their attention. For the listeners that are about to hear this interview with Blake, I think he is, he really exemplifies what you just said. I mean, he's a true believer and devotee of the written word. I mean, he's somebody that I don't think would like, could not do this anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I can't imagine there'll be a time where he quits or just doesn't do it anymore. I feel like part of his, his aesthetic is being relentless. And I, there's something really to me exciting about that. Cause it, it brings to mind brutalism. It brings to mind like Renaissance paintings. They're just so fucking massive, you know, and Hieronymus Bosch that there's like a, a sense of chaos attached to it, but it's obviously, it, it takes so much craft to do. And I think part of that, like, relentless endless aesthetic is you know it's almost like part of it is just not being able to quit you know it's funny i heard uh brady Sinellis talking about that movie dune which i thought was fine okay we don't have to get into it but he he said that the director is a visionary with no vision and i thought that was really interesting and it's something that really stuck with me and it and it and it, and it seems to be the antithesis of an artist like Blake butler where it's someone with just all vision all drive and that is the thing that motivates them that pushes the aesthetic forward that to me just makes their work so exciting and just before i forget too there's a third book of his that we talk about blake has many books but we mainly talk about alice not 300 million and he has another one called Nothing, which is about insomnia and its role in history, art, and science. And it's filtered through Blake's creative process and perspective on reality. And it's his only book that is, at least for now, that's nonfiction. Um, it's somewhat of a memoir, and it still fits into this relentless uh, aesthetic that uh, we're talking about, especially when you, as somebody that is also an insomniac, I can totally relate to the idea of this place that just feels like this like hallucinatory head trip that I think he just, he captures so perfectly. And something that I think is really exciting about that type of relentlessness in the way that it explicitly courts madness is that it, becomes this holy quest to overcome yourself. You know, or I mean, something we touched on in the interview is this idea of forbidden books, you know, or something that Lovecraft talks about a lot, you know, in the sense that like you could read a book that would both illuminate you and drive you insane in a permanent sense, you know, in the same moment and, and not coincidentally, but because truly experiencing reality is akin to what, from our current point of view, we would see as madness. Right. So the sense that you're, you know, really pushing yourself into that space is almost the opposite of the process of someone like Denis Villeneuve making do, you know, who, who I admire too. And he is, he is a master craftsman, but he's almost doing the opposite, which is like achieving total control over a knowable reality. Yes. Whereas I think someone like Blake is, you know, seeking an unknowable reality, almost seeking to sacrifice himself to forces that are palpable that you can feel are out there but you can never know what they are and you, and you sort of have to 
risk them doing what they want with you if you offer yourself to them. Yeah, I really like that. I'm currently living in Michoacan, Mexico, and I think I want to lead us out of this intro with <laughs> this idea that you had just brought up of seeking a knowable reality. Because the other day or the other night, I was walking around this pueblo that I'm staying in, which is like in the middle of nowhere. And it's really trippy at night because for one, like all the lights that come out from the houses are all different colors in terms of them being like tungsten or fluorescent lights. So there's like a mix of like white lights and blue. And also like the way the houses are uh, put together is that like some of them are like three different architectural styles. So it almost feels as though the houses are growing and like they're just taking on like new limbs that are like a modern, a modern limb on top of like some old like colonial style. And it's just, it's incredibly trippy. But however, this night I was walking around and I found a church and it just looked like a, you know, like a pretty church. I was like, oh, maybe I'll pop my head in because it something about it just looked different from the outside. And it turns out it was a decommissioned church and it was turned into a library. And inside it was just all the all the bookshelves were pushed to the to the sides and all the desks, you know, where people work at that have like the little light were covered in plastic. And it was just super eerie. It felt like a like a dream or like a, like a music video or something. And the wind from outside was like rustling in the plastic. But at the end of the church, there was this choir practicing. And I don't know like what they were practicing for, but it wasn't like for an audience. I was like the only person there, but I brought out my recorder and I wanted to just lead us out with this recording I took in this decommissioned church slash library. It seems like a, a good place to uh, summon our interview with Blake Butler. I can't, uh, can't wait to hear it. Let's go into the, into the catacombs and see where we emerge. kind of always wanted to ask you about this. I was talking to David about this yesterday, but I went to high school in the late 90s. And I remember I had found a book during that time that was by somewhat underground author that wasn't someone like William Burroughs or Norman Mailer. And this book just completely blew my mind. It totally just rearranged how I thought about language, how language could be sculptural, how it could become this just incredibly airtight atmosphere. And this book is something that's not very known. And mm. I have to say, nothing has really come close to it aside from Pierre Guyato and your writing, specifically 300 million. And I couldn't tell if maybe you had written about this book in the past. Like I Googled it, David had Googled it. We hadn't come up with anything. So I can't tell if this is just like a false memory or if this is just like a link that you had up and had gone away, but had you ever read The Consumer by Michael Jira? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's a uh, that that's funny. I late nineties. I think I don't think I ever had a copy of it that was mine, but I definitely I, I I heard about it for years before I was able to ever able to track it down. Just the aura of that book being like violent and and like Cormac McCarthy like, and I was a big Swans fan too, so. Uh, I, f I think they finally reissued it and I have a real copy here somewhere, but yeah, that, that's, that's, um, Swan's aesthetic and like that whole, um, I don't know what even genre he falls in, but I, there was something weird about the, like the way that book got around that was like being passed. I think, I feel like that is true of Brian Evanson's early work too, where it was like this weird little zine or this weird book full of nasty shit. 
I have to, I'll have to send it to you and maybe I'll, I'll post this on the Twitter if it's not too shameful, but I remember I had gone to see Henry Rollins do a spoken word thing with my mom, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous. And That's I actually nice. have a photo with me and Henry Rollins and I just look like the biggest turd. I've got like a basketball jersey on and like <laughs> a million pewter necklaces and uh, like a hardcore kid hat. And um, Henry Rollins is just <laughs> making like the most like insane, like silly face. Uh, but he had that <laughs> publishing label at the time. I forgot what it was called. I think it was like just some Four, numbers or something. 412.92, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. And um, I discovered it there. And I didn't really know anything about who Michael Jira was or who the Swans were. But, you know, I, I read the back and I was like, well, this seems like something I could get into. And uh, <laughs> it, it really like made a quite an impression on me at that time. And it, I like, I feel like your work has been somewhat of a continuing conversation or a continuum with that aesthetic. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, that whole, like, I don't know, I don't know what swans are different now, but like the early swans where it is really like, there's something about the way he has, uh, it's not just the tone of his voice, but his lyrics, he just like, he's able to break open this weird space between violence and something else that has always kind of intrigued me in the same way you're talking about but yeah yeah that's that's a cool association I feel I feel like that's definitely like a huge influence on me in that I don't even know why I feel like I, I was a big nerd too and like for why are nerds attracted to like violent art because we want to <laughs> kill people for making fun out of us <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll have our revenge in the spirit world yeah yeah we'll, we'll turn this around at some point i mean <laughs> it's funny that it also like the fact that neither paul nor i could find where you had mentioned that book because i don't know how else i would have discovered it either like i have this pdf of it on my desktop that i read at some point and must have downloaded from somewhere and i don't know how i would have heard of it except from reading one of your your articles Blake but then like I couldn't find it anywhere which almost felt fitting that like I, I don't know I feel like a lot of your work has this quality of you know it's like an understatement to say like viral ideas but like ideas that spread without seeming to have a source or like spread of their own accord somehow yeah that's that's awesome and I and and for me too my experience of that book like I heard about it was like an urban legend or something like he this guy wrote this really messed up book and and you can't get it and like I think it's it got served justice by being on a label that was like that disappeared and made it hard to find so that by the the time I finally got a hold of it I was so excited about it had so much power built into it before I even opened it which I I, I don't know how that relates to like writing itself, but I, I like these objects that have mystique of that nature. And um, I, don't, I used a Michael Jira quote for a, for a um, epigraph in one book. Maybe maybe that's a bridge of some sort, uh, but that came from a, sw a song and not the consumer. But um, so, so you didn't write about it. I might have. I don't know. <laughs> OK, it, it's a, it's something I would have mentioned or talked about in some po at some point somewhere, maybe. But I, I don't remember where it would be. That's interesting. And did you read Pierre Guillotto after or before that? Oh man, that would be much much later. Yeah, two for five hundred thousand soldiers. That's the same thing. Whereas like this book is really messed up, and you can't find it. And <laughs> when you, do, you when you do, it's. I mean, in that case, I feel like the consumers like light petting compared to Guillotto's like cramming every misery that's ever existed down your throat on every page, but. And he was really in war, right? He was like in Algeria. I mean, he like saw it firsthand in a different sense, right? Yeah, and he also had, I mean, he, I think his PTSD and like his, his sex, I mean, like he masturbating while he's writing, like going to these places where he's like almost out of his own control. Whereas like I, I watch Michael Jira perform and I'm like, he gets there in performance, but I also think he's got this weird uh, ability to control it a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's sort of the American thing of, you know, since the Civil War, at least, like, not having war on our soil, like, we're always in this kind of, like, adult state of, like, constant violence, but not, like, a clarifying and unifying violence the way Europe, like, just went through in a totally different way. <laughs> yeah, we, our wars are hidden, and, like, we're, we're part of it without knowing that we're in it, sort of, so it's, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, we haven't been at war in forever, but, oh, we've been at war, we have been at war forever, we just 
they don't tell us anymore, you know? Like, and, and we like act it out in this like real and pretend way in terms of like serial killers and mass shootings and this kind of like media violence that we do at home as a almost way of recognizing what we know is happening, but is also abstracted from us. Yeah, the feedback's on so tight that you, yeah, you can't see over it anymore. It's just like, it's in there. So that's, in that's an interesting comparison though with him being like, so, I mean, like, he got thrown into it, Guillotat, like, man, it makes me wonder, like, what would happen to American writing if we did go to war? And ha I mean, well, you don't want to go there, but, like, there's something there's something happening to us that, that in this being disguised from it that's really scary, almost more scary than the violence, because, I don't know, I feel like it's all getting anesthetized so much that people don't even know how to identify it anymore. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up, because just to bring it back to your previous book, 300 million, one moment that relates to this idea of like an inchoate sort of American amorphous violence and the idea of, I guess, in some way knowing that we're at war, but not really being able to identify it is the insurrection, this event that happened on January 6, which really, to me, and this might just be my you know, whatever, my, my point of view as a reader. But I wondered when you had seen footage of the insurrection on January 6th, did it in any way like inhabit the same headspace that you were in while you were writing that book? <laughs> That's, oh man, it's it's hard to it's hard to connect the two because they, they feel so far apart. But I, I mean, there's no way that it's not like, uh, there is something manic about this tribe of boys like, oh, well, I guess in, in 300 million, you're not, the gender is fluid, but uh, this tribe of people being drawn forth. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much the people that were there even knew, knew what they were doing. When you watch the video, the people storming around, it's like, we're in and now we're just marching around in our stupid outfits and we don't like even know smoking what... blunts and taking selfies yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, again they don't even know what they represent they're just there because they think i'm pissed off and like biden's bullshit and blah 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 it's like you guys don't they can't see what they're doing and so uh, in in that way i think that the viral aspect of of the disease uh, of what happens to people in my book is is very fairly similar in that they're almost like possessed by their own ambient violence that they live in uh, instead of being making decisions and choices. Absolutely. And I, it also felt like that moment really felt like an emanation point of Americana and also something very toxic about our psyche that has really been cultivated online and that it in some way manifested itself and come to life. And in some ways, it was very like banal and stupid. And it was like you were saying, they're just kind of ambling around. But there was also something truly awesome and horrific about it. And I mean awesome in like the same way that like 9-11 was awesome in that it was just this, this moment of media that just completely like blanketed your uh, psyche. And it was hard to, it was hard to breathe. It was hard to think of anything else. And I just felt like something about that moment and your book just felt like um like cracking open some sort of like gaseous shell of americana and just like taking a whiff of what's inside and um yeah i don't know maybe i'm just like <laughs> going too far out on a limb with this but it really seemed to like no, um, no. be a corollary to me yeah i think it's i think that's right and i i mean i'm trying i was trying to get at the like i mean we, we call these people bumbling idiots and they're smoking blunts in there in the capital and whatever, but like there is real violence and real menace behind something. And I mean, like they, those people don't know what they're doing, but someone does. That's kind of how I always looked at Trump too, is like, this guy's a demagogue. He's an idiot. He's, he doesn't know what the hell he's saying, but that doesn't mean he's devoid of power. He he's actually, it's more scary because you can't see the thing behind the thing. And that, you know, that's always the great thing about, like horror movies is like the second they reveal the monster, you're like, oh, that's not scary. But the fact that you can't see the monster is what keeps that tension going. And and that's always a trick I've used in writing is like avoid avoid putting a face on it because then the imagination once you uh, once you uh, allow the imagination to start doing its work, it, it gets bigger than the thing itself. So, and I think to sense that, you know, it's like the idea we mentioned before of 
you know, this yearning for violence to be transcendent or to like crack open some other realm, you know, whether it's a kind of heaven or a kind of hell, but it's like this similar feeling of looking at a figure like Trump or a figure like, you know, I know you've written about David Koresh and Paul and I did this, took this trip to Waco a few months ago, but like oh, these yeah. kinds of people who seem to embody forces that seem like couldn't exist on earth, but do somehow manifest through these human avatars and it's always the question of like is it just them or is it actually something beyond them that they're tuning into it's a great question yeah i i think i think it's both i think like people get involved with things for thinking that they know what they're doing but there, there's something to anime i don't know i watch some of my some people i know that like you know i'm from georgia so i know some people that like think differently than me and uh when i try to talk to them about it, it it always feels like they're talking like with puppets or something it's like you you keep talking about something that's not what is actually going on here and uh that's some of the machinery of like fox news and and all these like devices you know uh, what the, this let's go brandon thing that people are all in a, in, in a tizzy about it's i look I, yeah. I finally googled it just to figure out what it was and it's like you guys think that like this pundit telling you that misquoting the audience is the example of the degradation of the american system like you, you you're not you're not totally insane to 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 question things but you, the things you're getting pointed at are, are you're just a trained dog for i, I don't know how that happens and, and, and but yeah when you look at like waco or the holocaust or anything it's like it's always these groups of people that think they're doing something different than what they're doing but they're once they the the they figure it out it's like well it's too late now i'm just looking out for my own ass or something you know? and then it's like the sequence is initiated right it's like when you start that something yeah. else takes over and then it's you know you're a puppet too right so in yeah. a sense it's i think this this is something that you know all of us and by extension like whoever might be listening to this probably have in common is like an interest in a kind of paranoid creativity or like the idea of trying to open these spaces where things are unresolved, you know, because it's like, if you just look at the surface reality of any, you know, Fox or it's, you know, MSNBC or whatever, it's like, there's this sense that like something's not right or something doesn't add up. But if right. you try to go beyond it and say, well, here's what it is, then you've just fallen victim to something else. Right. But it's like the space of art to me seems like a willingness to just exist in a paranoid mentality and actually make something out of that rather than trying to solve it by just accepting a different answer, which is always going to be a puppet answer of some kind. That's well said. Yeah. I think, I think everyone is uh, to, uh, to be alive is suffering and people want to seek the source of their suffering. And, you know, like art is a great way to get there in a way that isn't harming anyone, but uh, people that aren't artists or like, don't have art in their, you know, like my cousins don't, they wouldn't know what the fuck a painting was if you held it up in front of it. They'd be like, what is this garbage? My kid can make that, that classic stuff. But like they are in, in not being able to access that in a, in a, in a, in a less direct way they, they end up like, I don't know. It seems like there's like rolling down a hill and then they end up rolling through a pile of shit and now they're covered in shit. And now they're <laughs> walking around covered in shit and they, I don't know. It's, it's like, there's a slippery slope to it that's really scary and and the unexaminedness of it um really becomes the fuel of it and do you ever feel like with your own work because i feel like so much of it obviously you know there's a lot of artifice in that it's you know there's a surreal element to it but it also seems like you're very interested in courting this insane energy that we're talking about and translating it into something non-lethal like art or whatever, like a book. Is that like something that you're conscious of when you're trying to start a new project? Yeah, I mean, to me, like, to me, I'm writing about reality in a more, in a way that feels more like reality. Like when, when I read a, a book that's called Realism and it's like John goes to the gas station and buys peanuts, like, <laughs> I don't know what they're, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't, and nor do I know why I would care exactly. I don't know, storytelling for me is more, is, I've always been less interested in like the plot of a story or, or even like the mechanics of how a story moves through um, like things that feel like what we do on a daily basis. Cause they're still not. So it, to me, that's a bigger realism is a bigger lie than, than 
I, I don't even want to call what I what I do surrealism. I, I, I call it I, like it's it's gathering off affect and it's also gathering like this un, this kind of like underlying tension that we're kind of talking about. It's like, where is the tension? Like, I'm just sitting here in my in my house again. But why do I feel so insane when I, you know, and it's not just the Internet, <laughs> like it's it, there's something underlying everything that I think that's what's always haunted me is like these things that appear to be right in front of us uh, are not what they seem or or they or they can't be described in a way that will ever get them. So why shouldn't I try to talk about them differently than than the way they seem, if that makes sense? Yeah. And I got the sense from you a lot that. You know, like that phrase, something underlying everything, you know, is often literal in your work, right? That you have a lot of like underground vaults and tunnels and these sort of physical connections. And I think actually the way that it dovetails with the internet is really interesting. You know, I mean, I think you have the sense that the internet, you know, it exists as a digital space, but like there's something literal about it, or it is a manifestation of something else that actually exists in some much more totalizing way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that like the internet is a good dummy version of of what a book could do if it were allowed. Uh, like I remember being a kid and watching Inspector Gadget. Uh, did you guys watch Inspector Gadget? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that that book Penny had. She had this. Oh, she had yeah. this electronic book that she could like <laughs> control weird devices with and like do do weird stuff with. It. And I was always like, that's like, what is that book? And how do I how do I get that? So I would like. I think it started for me with like I'd go to the I remember going to the hardware store and finding this weird notebook thing that had lots of folders and different stuff in it and I was like okay this is close to what Penny had so like but what's missing why doesn't it do like why can't I type into it and a robot does this so like to me it was like language is code sort of and language does language is this bridge between not to describe my reality but to like connect my reality to this thing we're talking about you know so which it was, which is tricky because it still looks like you're describing reality, and it pisses people off when you when you when you combine the two, sort of. But uh, I don't know. That's where my interest keeps dragging me forward. And maybe you are describing a reality. You know, it's like the kind of realism of John, John buying peanuts is like just doubling down on this kind of wishful thinking that the apparent <laughs> reality is the only one, and like right, this, and there's <laughs> nothing below that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which there's like nothing animating guys, him. Right. Or, yeah, or making him insane when he's just eating his peanuts and, like, shouldn't be insane. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and even, I mean, like, j just just the dreams have always been a thing that, like, um, are, are verboten. For some reason, they're called verboten in fiction. I guess it's because it's it's not plot a plot device. But, like, I've always dreamt of, like... Uh, I've had recurring dreams of like these landscapes where they do they it all it's almost like there's a network or a backdrop to reality that allows these places to connect and 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 I don't I don't know what what it is that haunts me or drives me to keep coming back to that it's not just dreams but uh, it seems to be missing from the world and so I, I tr the the closer we can keep trying to like add layers to its face it's revealed more it, it seems like you're it's not something that's ever going to reveal itself entirely. So it needs to be revo revealed in layers. And that's the work of humanity, sort of. Yeah. And like the internet, especially lately, really feels like a lot of that psychic energy is being solidified there and being trapped in there. And one thing that kind of occurred to me, because as you were saying that like language is like code. And also, I'm so happy that you brought up Penny's notebook that like is the best <laughs> memory. It's like that and Dick Tracy's watch like blew me away as a kid. But to keep this on track, you know, we were, I was also thinking about how I think some of your books or some of your writing definitely draw strands from this like dreamlike, almost violent psychic energy of the internet. And it's what's interesting about it is that it's both now something that seems nostalgic, but it's also something that's present. All this energy is something that started like over 10 years ago. And when you think back to those like early Reddit days, that early whatever Chan culture, it's it is like there's something nostalgic about it. And I think, you know, bringing it back to the insurrection, it is strange how 
all of that energy has now seemed to manifest itself in real life. And I'm also thinking about like GameStop and AMC and all of these like ever present loops that seems to be so tied in with the internet. Is that like also something that you're trying to harness or that you're aware of? Yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, I always laughed when like friends and Franzen's idea that like you, you can't have an internet connection and write at the same time because like I feel paranoid or or like I'm missing something when I'm disconnected from the possibility of of like uh, accessing other information. You know, I, I like to use the web, my web browser not like as a as a distraction, but as like a I don't know. It's almost uh, associative or something like. Uh, you're you're able to combine combine with the world a little bit more directly to me when you you know you pull up what people are talking about or you find t these links that connect you to information that a describes the world and yet it's been condensed into this small amount of language. That's always felt like fuel to me of like the limits of my mind are only contained with within this room, but like at any moment I can get like pinged or 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 like struck by these fragments that are floating everywhere and 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 I'm and, and the course of what I'm typing changes and so I to me it's a, people people also like to uh, on the opposite side of friends and they like to romanticize this like I am channeling I'm channeling demons when or I'm channeling the unknown when I write and, I, and it's like that's a little bit over zealous thinking to me it's like <laughs> you're still you and you're and you're a filter for the world so but to be to allow yourself to be open to other these other little currents kind of like makes the world larger right in front of you or something. I don't know. Um, now, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of your early work is associated with the internet, you know, whether it's HTML giant or, you know, you're presenting your work through the internet in different ways. And then how do you think that has evolved over, let's say that the 2010s, as we look to the 2020s, like something feels different in what the, both literally what the internet is and what the culture around it is. But yeah. I feel like it's hard, it's hard to quite express how. It, it feels a lot less free for one thing. I mean, we, we, there used to be, you know, like, I mean, I was a BBS dial in kid, like using my parents' phone at midnight to like call into other computers and shit and like look for, I was, I was looking for like, I didn't know what I was looking for in the early internet. You know, it's like, what are these computers I'm allowed to dial into? What are all these numbers and these files? Most of it's porn, but you know, <laughs> uh, the, there seemed it seemed like you were burrowing into something whereas now it's like i don't I, I find it hard to even know where to begin to look for literary content you know it's like everything's pushed into these corporate uh devices that we all use because we think that's the only way to get seen whereas uh i hope we're at the beginning of a of a turn against that it seems like people are getting sick of it but it feels like the last 10 years are pretty much this l slow drowning of the ability to think for think or speak without feeling shitty. I don't know. I think it is true. Like I sort of have this idea that you could describe it as going from an age of demons to an age of gods, the same way maybe in like, you know, different mythic structures, the same thing happens, right? Where you have the age of demons, which is like, you know, weird porn and chat rooms and your parents being like, don't trust, you know, whoever and people buy drugs and, you know, watching videos of like, you know, murders and stuff like that. And then that's the era of demons, which is presented as like a dangerous and chaotic era. It is in some ways, but is mm -hmm. also a more liberated era. And then we're now in this era of gods, which is just like total top-down control, right? It's just Amazon and Twitter and Facebook and, you know, whatever. And now the question is like, is that also breaking apart into this new era of demons that will have some other form, but will be about resisting that centralization? And is there a way to transcend the loop? Are we going to continue to be stuck in this this time of gods? And the only way to break free of it is to go back to the past and reenact this pervasive sense of nostalgia that seems to be so embedded within PR and marketing and pop culture. Or what is the next frontier after this? It's a great question. I mean, I, I I try to have hope. I try I try to like put my head down and just think like writing and reading both begin with like one of the most intimate forms of behavior that there is you know you and a blank page or you and this document that someone else made out of out of their own experience with the blankness and so like i keep relying on that like it all comes back to that and and, and like i 
sometimes in, in more pessimistic modes, I'm, I'm like, oh, well, in 10 years, no one's going to be able to read anymore unless it's, uh, you know, like got something attached to it. But I don't really know if, I don't know. I, I remain hopeful to think that like there's something sacred and, and it's funny we're talking about gods in this like top down control, like your behavior, you have to follow the rules or you get ex excluded, which is a probably more <laughs> realistic version of gods, but also like the, 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 the act itself is sacred and that, and that that's the God. If there's a God involved here, I'd like to get back to this like exploration that, that the internet could come and go, you know, like fuck the internet. If it falls apart, I'm still going to write, on this, whatever I can find and, and try to explore my, the limits of my world. Right. In a manner of speaking, I actually have less fear than I did even a couple years ago that people will lose the ability to read. I actually think in a way people are even like quite young people are maintaining. I mean, it might always be a relatively small group of people, but I think like even people who are like teenagers now, like actually can seriously read and like want to in a way that I'm, it is really good. I'm very reassured by it. Yeah, that's good to hear. I think that I've noticed that too. And and even just as like, you know, we all get fatigued. It's all, it's, it's been a hard few years. Like I, I read less this year than I have in a long time, but you know, uh, now that some of the dust smoke is settling or it seems to, and I, I there's not, you can't replicate the experience of a, like a movie does absolutely nothing in, in the, in the providing of an experience. And I think that, that until we come up with, there's a technology that can beat the written word for, for the layers of different kinds of things. It's, it allows you as, I mean, people want to call it entertainment, but just experience like, um, I, yeah, I don't, there's, there's yet to be even painting I don't, there's nothing music, whatever, blah, 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 all these media, like nothing has replaced the word, the ability of the word to, build something in a for no cost at a at an extremely high rate of possibility and that's what always, that's what drew me there in the beginning was like you know I was playing in bands with my friends and being like I have to go to band practice and buy all this gear and wait for these assholes to show up on time and the more I wrote I was like this is you know like I can do with one sentence what a movie couldn't do with a billion dollar budget I don't know how we'll ever displace that but uh is it the attention that's the problem or is it the medium? I can't tell. I, know, I heard a great quote, by, j just a little quote by um, Mark Danielewski. I think it was, he said this when someone was saying about, you know, do you think folks will stick around? And he said, well, as long as people will, as long as people remain conscious, they will always need a way to be alone and not alone with their thoughts that are not their thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. But do you feel like with your writing, like it's like keep drilling into this but it seems to be so rooted in america and this thing that we're talking about with the necessity and the need to write to not only break out of this loop and whatever reach a new plane like do you ever feel that your work is in some way designed for you to transcend america man that's a that's a great question um i don't know i've always had this very like anti like I hate the ideals of America, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, like, there's a, I, I don't know, there's like a shell game going on where it's like, this is a place where you can speak your mind and make what you want. And I do believe that, like, it feels like the, the, the cage gets smaller and the, and the, and the walls are closing in almost like, uh, I don't know, that's, that's a, that's a image that always, I fi keep finding myself writing and having to erase. It's like the, the walls are, the walls are, a a, a hundredth of a centimeter shorter today than they were yesterday and i don't know it's like slow suffocation so yeah i mean if i didn't write if i didn't have an ability to sit with that and and have an out uh, i'd probably be a much more boring person but it does feel like there's a spirit that that people that are still sane and still trying and haven't given up there's something that we that we seem to b still believe in here, and 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 we don't, you know, everyone hates Amazon, everyone hates these corporations, not because of their their service, sir, not because of their service, but because of this weird narrowing of of life uh, that seems to be going on. And so, I don't know. I I, I guess I I still haven't been crushed enough, surprisingly, to think that like, well, you're not gonna. If you're not going to crush me, you're not going to crush some other people, and 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 so this becomes a a war of its own. You know, it does feel like a bit of a war sitting down and be like, here I am again in this damn chair, 
doing this thing that I don't know why I do, except that like, I can't figure out why I would live without it, uh, you know, so. And in a way it almost could become, you know, if like the space gets smaller every day in an almost like masochistic sense, it also becomes that much more sacred to keep doing it every day. You know, that you're like, you know, totally. yesterday the space was as small as it could be. And today it's even smaller, but I'm <laughs> still going to do it. There's something kind of holy about that, I think. Oh yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. It, it, the, it does feel more dire in that way. And, and um, yeah, if you're, if you're able to accomplish anything in that kind of an environment, uh, it's, it's one more link in the chain holding it out. So what about like the physical spaces of America? Because something that I've always been drawn to within your books is how you're able to channel some sort of spiritual energy from these freakish spaces like suburbia and the frozen food aisle and malls and like chilies and, and kind of infusing it with a certain video game logic. <laughs> is like, can you pinpoint where that obsession started? Oh man. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> now you're like, now I understand why other people were complaining about this show being too weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, tracing it back. I mean, hmm. oddly, like I want, I think I remember uh, VH video, so video rental stores more than anything. And like, I think my insomnia as a child kind of began when I watched this Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, they had this series of, vid of videos where they would kind of take you on this little tour of oddities that supposedly represented Ripley's like project of building out this like weird cabinet of oddities. And uh, there was this video of a ghost. It, they were trying to tell the story of a ghost and, and it was one of this double exposure where you can like see the woman in the picture. She's not there. And I don't know, there was like, I knew it was fake, but there was something about it that was like, if they can, if they can make that look like that, then where am I? Um, what, what is, what are the posters on? Oh no. And before that, uh, I never knew what this movie was for years, but there's, a, I had this, I saw this movie on TV as a, as a really young kid and the scene is of a, of a wall covered with posters and it's like all these, um, you know, classic American sports stuff, but it, there's so many posters on the wall, you can't see the wall and you can't really see what any of the posters are. And this, another image of these, of like, it's, uh, I forget what, it, what they actually are, but they, they start chasing this kid who lives in this room and he pushes the wall and the wall keeps going back further and further and he's running from these like demon ghosts uh and he pushes the wall back so far that he ends up falling into this hole type thing and i and i never knew what this movie was for like 15 years and my friend told me it was uh time bandits the terry gilliam movie but yeah um, yeah uh that image and not being able to connect it to what it actually was and not knowing if i had made it up i don't know there's this like weird line between like nostalgia and memory and like where you, what that is inside your head at any given moment. Absolutely. And it's funny, uh, this is a topic that's come up before, but I definitely love to rope you into it, but I'm assuming that we're of a similar age and this movie that you're talking about also seems to connect to like, for me, one of the movies that also kind of, I don't know, piqued my interest or started to make me think of America differently as a physical space, as a spiritual space, as the poltergeist in that there was the potential that you could be watching TV and get sucked into some other negative space where you were both behind the walls, but not in the physical realm. And I just yeah. feel like in the 80s, there were so many references within children's entertainment of portals. And it was almost like we were yeah. preparing ourselves to be pushing through a portal, which is odd that like a decade later, we got the internet and we went through like an actual portal, but somehow still the, uh, I guess more like haptic, like just like trying to illustrate it, like the scene that you're talking about from Time Bandits and, and Labyrinth where, you know, or never ending story where you could just like push through a wall and like go to another dimension seem like such a, a prevalent part of our childhood. That's interesting. It's true. Yeah. It, it, it seems the more I think about it, the more th that's just like through everything to the point that like, 
yeah if you watch that in a movie and and, and it's in all these things you start like i remember like drawing a map of my grandmother's basement because she had a door in her basement that looked like it was part of the wall and i could pull it open and then there was like she was a really good bowler so she had a she, all that was inside this like weird tunnel alongside the thing were all these weird trophies of her bowling and i was like see like this is there are fake spaces in this house and like uh this is a dummy one but if i map it out and um i can find it and and it, it has to be there you know and so uh, yeah there's this weird paranoia at mixed with inspiration sort of it's like at the same time you're scared and intrigued and i wonder also it you know, in terms of like thinking of the 80s, you know, and I feel like a lot of the people who are coming of age now and are kind of defining the culture now, you know, grew up in the 80s or 90s, you know, and there's like going back to that idea of a kind of undead American optimism. I wonder if that's part of it that, you know, the 80s was this time when there was no longer a feeling of American expansion, right? There certainly wasn't a frontier and there wasn't even this like 50s sense of maybe the suburbs could be exciting or like all of that was over. Right. But we still, I think, had this kind of haunted and, you know, like Clive Barker or Cronenberg-esque sense of like within these kind of gross modern, you know, urban or suburban spaces, there was still another world. Like there can't not be another world. Right. And And to give in to thinking that there's not another world was like, was lame sort of i don't know i i think a lot of I, I have a lot of like old man nostalgia for diy culture and like i look around and i i think like when when i was a kid in the 90s it was like selling out was lame like having brands on your shit was lame like you did like you would not want to be called trendy but now like the culture has, re has turned that over and i don't think that's the youth's fault i think that's like these the, the top down thing once again where it's like no you if you if you're not getting money for what you do, then then it must be bank bankrupt. It's like there's some, the internet stole something from us in that way. I think the DIY like we don't need anything to make this, and now we need every all it's all within this other structure. Or it's not validated until it's posted. You know, okay, I read this book mm. called Psychopolitics, and he was basically saying that you know there's the Foucault idea of biopolitics, right? Of you know going on strike or putting your body on the line, or you know that it had to resisting power in say the 60s and 70s according mm -hmm. to Foucault is like always physical right you couldn't just talk about it and this right. new book is basically saying you know we're way beyond that at least in a lot of arenas in that our physical bodies are almost irrelevant like we're basically our cyborgs or like holograms for most intents and purposes mm -hmm. but the one thing you can still do according to this book is like have a thought and not tweet it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, which 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 kind of sucks. Like it goes against my nature at the beginning. And I've seen people say stuff like that about Twitter. It's like, hey, like when you tweet out a good idea, uh, you're shorting yourself from being able to use it in something. And I was like, I used to think like, well, there's so many ideas that who fucking cares which one you put where? Like, but now it does feel like there's this weird shamefulness about it. Like if it doesn't, you know, even if you are the most headstrong person ever, like you are thinking about what others think of you and that therefore like changes the nature of the thought itself and and and, and that's a slippery slope that seems really scary i like what you're saying about the like the, sh the shift from the body to this front where i don't know that's scary <laughs> right but but it also seems to be tied into the idea that the amount of labor we put into something like twitter when you look back at it or into the internet and like you were saying about um they're not being diy spaces like because everything is focused on the nexus of the internet that it's hard to give value to your labor now because you know like you're not seeing it it's just all kind of all on one space on one screen so it's hard to like think of it as something important. And at least if you can manifest an avatar that you know will be appreciated and get liked, that then it makes sense or then it's valuable. And if you can put that tweet up and it gets those likes, then it's good. But then the importance of maybe saving those ideas and like put, condensing them into a book becomes like less relevant to the broader culture. But to me, I think this is the thread that you were on, or at least the the thread that I'm picking up on, on and why and on what I think is kind of being lost, and something that I, I think has been talked about in different ways um, in the past. I feel like I feel like you're exactly right about that, and I don't 
I don't know. I used to think like Twitter's good because I can keep in touch with people, but at the same time, it's like this different transaction now. And it, and it isn't, the, it, it feels like wrestling with like AI instead of wrestling with the per it's like, I'm, I'm communicating with my friend's avatar. Therefore I don't need to ever talk to my friend or see if they're okay or like see what they're doing. You know, it's like, Oh, they made a joke. So that's what they're doing. Um, it's like stand-ins for every, everybody has a stand-in now. Absolutely. But uh, do you also feel like there is a sculptural aspect to your work and that the book as a form and as a physical object is part of that, that entire process and manifesting a specific tone into this, you know, into this physical object that's like edited and curated. And, you know, you've, I'm assuming, you know, you've gone through it many times, like to shape that idea that you have, like, whether it be like an Alice knot or 300 million into this one object, into this one experience. Yeah. Yeah. Sculpture is a great word for it. I definitely like, I like revising more than I like drafting. Uh, so I'll, I'll write a really quick short. I, I try to write a, a, a first draft as fast as I can, just because to get the ideas down, kind of like lay rely on my psyche to like do some of this work and put some things in there that I, if I were using pure logic and uh, I wouldn't necessarily get it there and then playing with it, going back and seeing what the language, you know, almost the same way of like, we're, we're trusting that there's something else beyond. Therefore I have to find it. And so it becomes more of a sculpture or, or like a, a maze type thing where going and seeing, seeing what the room looks like, playing with some things, move this wall a little bit, see what's there. Uh, and I, I've always kind of trusted that process that like, um, it's not all on, it's not all on me as a, as a writer to, to define even the, the essence of the story it's, it's in there to be found. And, uh, I don't know, an, another image from, from my youth that's kind of connected all this that I've written about a bit, but like, I keep coming back to is like having a dot matrix printer and like, having an error message that would like, you know, I try to print something and it would, it would fuck up and, and it would start spitting pages and pages of like what looked like gobbledygook and symbols and stuff. And I was just so sure that if I took that paper, I would, I, you know, I could <laughs> find weird ruins in it or like weird things. And even though that like, most likely that's just a bunch of gibberish, like that process of seeking meaning in gibberish creates an experience of its own. And, and I think that's, that's almost, uh, it's not quite what I'm doing in writing because it's not gibberish to begin with, but there is this like kind of sifting and sculpting and, and revealing that happens. In a way it relates to the sense of like still trying to find maybe not beauty, but like a living potential in the like trash spaces of America. You know, to be like, I'm gonna like hang out at the 7-Eleven and like turn it into something beautiful or something, <laughs> something like that. You know, is ominous and has an aura. It's in some way like a more profound drive than like I want to live on a beautiful island in Hawaii or something. Totally, yeah, I love that. Yeah, and maybe think of the number in um, Pi or in the stock stock <laughs> secrets get printed out. And, like the guys try to steal his his printout. <laughs> <laughs> Because your books seem like like a tome to a specific obsession, what are you obsessed with now? Oh God, <laughs> um, these days obsessed. Um, I mean, does that seem accurate, or am I kind of just projecting that? Oh, I'm a very obsessive person. I get I get on things and ride them until uh, until I can't, until I can't <laughs> stand it anymore. Um, <laughs> these days, I mean, I. I've been in a kind of rebuilding and, and trying to like re refocus some of my old habits. I don't know. I've been doing a lot of like, Hey, I've always thought since I was 20 that this was the case. Why, why am I trusting 20 year old me to, to have known anything? And so I still have my obsessions. I mean, I, writing is still my main obsession. I still get up and do it first thing uh, if possible uh, and spend as much time, but I don't know. I'm trying, I'm really trying to get off myself <laughs> if I can. Um, I don't know what I'm, what it leads to, uh, but, and I wouldn't even call it an obsession, but uh, I don't know the, yeah, the, I, I think at the cost of all else, writing has been my main obsession and, and that's always been, you know, I can get, I can get obsessed with poker or uh, crypto or, or like um, 
other garbage things that float around in the world and, and kind of bide my time. But really, I think I've, I think I've accepted that the only thing that really gets me into this place is, is writing. And so unfortunately I'm still stuck on it. <laughs> I, mean, I think it just speaks to it having that sacred power that, you know, you can feel in your own life and you can feel if we try to imagine like human history and, and technological history that like there is some reason that we haven't given up on this. And it's almost like we've passed the point when we would have, which I think is kind of reassuring. That's true. That's a, that's an interesting way to put it. Like how, why, how is it still going and, and why, I don't know. I, every day I keep trying to think about when I wake up, like someone, t- I was thinking the other day about wh- what was this conversation? We were, we were talking about how like everyone wakes up and kind of has the routine that they get into and they start doing the thing, you know, and I, and I do it every morning, but I've been trying to think more recently, like when I wake up, like, why do I open my eyes and immediately grab my phone or immediately go in the bathroom and brush my teeth, blah, blah, blah. It's like, so the, some mornings I'll just lay there and I'll, and I also do this before I go to bed and like, just kind of sit there and let my brain roll. I don't know. Um, and 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 th- see the world differently you know i still live in the same room but this room if i if i've always believed this that this room could be something else like well why do i keep rushing past it i don't ever look at anything <laughs> i feel i catch myself all the time like caught in routines to the point that i don't even remember what i did all day or i read an entire book and i get to the end of the book and i'm like what was name one thing that happened in that book i don't know so like maybe maybe if I'm obsessed with anything, it's like slowing my ass down and 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 getting back to that sacred feeling of saying there is more to life than consuming and trying to get people to look at what I've already done or or et cetera. It's like I I need to settle into my body or I'm gonna go insane. Um and maybe I'm already insane and that's why I'm reversing that. But um uh, do you guys do you guys know what I'm talking about? About like uh, that that seems to me the only antidote to everything that's happening is to like hold the fuck on, slow down, like wait. What is that thing over there? <laughs> you know? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it it does seem like we're all in this state of free fall at the same time, and because of that, it seems like we're not falling. But when you slow down for a second, you start to see that like you're like holy shit, we are in a state of free fall and. The idea of turning language into something sacred or insane where it it becomes charged with a a mystical potential rather than using it to describe what we already see has some sort of important meaning, especially after enduring America during this pandemic. And for so many of us, this was definitely a moment of, like I've had this conversation before where, where we are recognizing this, not only about ourselves, but about like so many of our connections and relationships and attitudes towards the things that we love. I think this, this idea of wanting to slow down time seems very prevalent to me. To add on to the idea of slowing down, it's also like, you know, you don't have to use the idea of channeling something, but you can say, you know, wanting to use language to humble yourself or make yourself at the service of something, even if it's just like some other part of your own psyche rather than using language to promote yourself, which seems like mainly what we're encouraged to do, right? But yeah. instead to be like, I, I want to get lost in the maze. Like I want to be in the the vault with Alice in, in her paintings <laughs> or whatever else is down there. <laughs> you know, and almost want to get stuck. And then maybe this is like the poker side. You know, I want to see if I can come up with a way to get out, right? You want to play yeah. that game with fate. Totally. There's a weird, there's a weird shift between the logic and the unknown in that in that space. And I think, I think, you know, one one thing that a lot of people, anyone can, of any stripe of intelligence or, or background or interest, like like drugs have been the way that a lot of, you know, you drop acid, you'll see, you'll suddenly uh, realize how bullshit everything you were worked up about was. And it's like, after doing some acid for a while, it was like, why do I need acid to remind me that like, I value this and that, you know, like, or that, or that trees are alive or that or that the sky has a pattern in it that that's insane if i look at it for too long it's like there's so much right underneath and and i've been the most neglectful of all i look back at at my life and i say man i ran past so many things not you know not just my bedroom but like i you can easily walk past walk through life and not see anything and like if drugs are what it takes to slow you down and 
that's a that's a trade-off that some people make and end up losing their life to drugs but i think you can do it without drugs and reading reading a language is an intoxicant and a drug that is much safer and more pervasive that i'm trying to find the energy of of that also without drugs like the the intellect is allowed to thrive and, and not just be in the state of thrall you know because i know you've written a book in the past called nothing which has to do with your insomnia and this is something I really related to as well. I've been dealing with insomnia forever and I had been taking Ambien since the time I was like 17 till the time I was like in my thirties until it made yeah. me like completely fucking like nuts and had to go to rehab for it and deal mm -hmm. with like sleep studies and stuff. But I, I'm curious to just get an update from you. Like, where do you stand now in the, with, in relation to your insomnia? Like, how do you see that state now? It's, it's, it still comes and goes for me. I think I'm still like, uh, um, I, I, I hate to hear about the ambient thing. Cause I saw, I've, I tried that and use that at different times. And, and, and it's such a, such a different way to, to live with sleep really. I, so I, I, I don't know. I, I've always kind of like raw dogged my ability or inability to sleep right now. It's, uh, I smoke pot before I go to bed. That helps. But in general, like, really? Uh, yeah yeah i mean it doesn't activate your mind like and put it into overdrive no i mean it, some nights it does i feel like it's like 80 percent. it just kind of like mellows me out but um oddly when like when the weather changes if it gets warmer suddenly out like it'll get that wor worse again but i've kind of tricked myself back into a pattern of sleeping better but i don't know it, it comes and goes um and particularly like I, I know to, what to avoid. Like I don't look at, I don't do math or numbers or like high level brain stuff for like a few hours before bed. Cause like nothing will keep me, nothing is assured to keep me up as like reading a bunch of like statistics or something. Uh, what keeps you up? <laughs> oh my God, everything. I mean, you know, it's funny. So like, you know, I'd gotten off Ambien like a couple of years ago and, you know, around that same time too, I was just like so obsessed with anything that would just like shut me down. So, you know, that obviously like bled over into drinking too much or smoking weed. And it just like, that just be kind of became like this really um, toxic headspace that I kept falling into over and over again, where I was just like, man, how do I turn off? How do I turn off? And, yeah. you know, getting off of that and then getting on some other medication and then just being like, you know, just so afraid of dealing with insomnia. But the funny part is, is like during the pandemic, I remember when I got the, uh, I think it was the second dose of the vaccine and I just like came home and I was just like, holy shit, I'm so sick. And, uh, I had my, I have two dogs and I, <laughs> they were like in my way and I stuck my toe into the couch, like really hard. And I broke my foot <laughs> and, oh. and then I was just like, oh my God. And I had lost my job shortly before that. So I was just like, literally just like bedridden and sick. And um, I had just no other thing I could physically or mentally do other than just like lay in bed and just like kind of ride this out and deal with it. And uh, I have to say like, that was what helped me out. Uh, not to say that I don't deal with it now, but much like yourself, I pretty much just raw dog it for the most part. I mean, occasionally here and there, I'll take like an Advil PM or something and they pound the mm. melatonin and <laughs> whatever stuff like that. That doesn't really, I can't even tell if it's like a placebo or not, but um, it, it, it was weird in terms of what we were talking about of portals and, and passing through stuff. I feel like this was like the, this was that time for me where I was just like, you know what? I've had a monkey on my back for a long time and I'm just going to like, <laughs> deal with it and it kind of took like this total like degradation of, of body and health and and spirit and and depression to to get there but it ultimately was a really good thing and um I have to say though I, I really like loved your your book on the topic it was really like clear and it was interesting how you still took your your scaffolding and incorporated it with something that's nonfiction. do you find that you want to write another book of nonfiction? Well, thanks for saying that you like it. Yeah, it's um, it. I think I think that book in particular, like I was just like, and so I was so used to not sleeping that just like it just became normal. And and over time, it's funny that you say like all this tragedy and 
and pain is what resets your brain and kind of gets you able to get out of the idea of needing a placebo or whatever. Cause I do think it is, it's a mindset thing. It's a placebo thing to some degree. Totally. It's all about, it's all about attitude and being in the right mood. That's why like, I don't know. I can be pretty finicky about going to bed and getting up. It's like, don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Don't like, don't touch me. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and some nights are worse than others, but um, yeah, it's, there's an architecture to it for sure. And um, I really did like writing nonfiction. And, and for a long time, I thought fiction was my main thing for a long time. And now I, I've been writing a, a nonfiction book uh, over the last year or so. And uh, the process of writing nonfiction is starting to become more exciting to me than, than fiction, not just because auto fiction is a big dealer now or whatever. It's just, it feels like I've been avoiding myself uh or, or or you know we're talking about the like weird codedness of the fiction and how how thick it can be at times and, and it comes from a very personal place for me and it comes from a lot of effort to funnel my experience into something singular but but i think i'm finally in this new phase of trying to re-question old beliefs and and all that it's been suddenly like oh shit this is laying right in my lap like why don't i like finally open some doors like that in my brain. So that's where I'm at now. And I, and I, I suddenly can't remember how to write fiction. It feels like, so whenever I try to, otherwise it's like, what, this isn't my time. I don't know. I think it comes in phases or something. Well, it's like this mythic journey too, maybe where it's, you know, like you have to leave home to come back, you know, or it's like you leave yourself and go into this, you know, maybe like 20 year long journey of fiction and you do like the strangest and, you know, most extreme things you can and then it's like at the end of that journey, you meet yourself when you might have thought you would have met yourself at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a cool way to put it. Yeah, I think I think I mean when I wrote 300 million, my whole intent was to write the most fucked up book that I could uh, at the and I, I thought that it would be rejected by my editor and that I you know I had I had I had bleak plans, but in, in kind of like um, finding myself having overcome and like. I do have another novel coming out next year that's like was written a couple of years ago, but it's even more extreme than that. And it's like, really? I have challenged my, I've pushed my, I mean, on a language level. Yeah. It's, there's something in me, you talk about obsession. Like I'm obsessed with like outdoing my own limits or something while being just a guy in his office. So um, <laughs> I, I finally, like with this last thing, it's like, I, I'm broke. I broke it. Like I, I cannot go any further, nor do I want to. And so where do I begin? And so, yeah, I like that analogy of of getting to the, leaving home and finding yourself and and coming back to it because that's exactly what it feels like. What 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 is is this new book that you're talking about? Annex. Yeah, like a couple. What year was this? Uh, there was a, I I I was home alone for a summer and and like um, <laughs> had all of my time. You know, my my wife was gone for the summer, and so I read. Uh, what's that book called? The Most Dangerous Book. It's the history of the censorship of Ulysses. You guys know about that? No. Um, uh, it's an amazing story. It's just like the story of how Ulysses came to be published. And it was, you know, Sylvia Beach, uh, kind of like no one would fuck with it. And then there was a censorship and all this stuff. So I, so I, I read this really great history of like, and Joyce just being like this strange figure of loving the loving the to play along with it sort of and and i and i was like you know what like i i challenged myself to in the past to go to a certain extreme but i've never turned it on so hard that I, even i was confused and so <laughs> i i think an, there's still a very clear story sort of an annex but i it also um it breaks down some of the walls that even i had and uh to the point that I couldn't, I, I mean, it's almost like a raw text. I didn't really edit it. Uh, every other book I've ever written, I've revised like 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 times, whatever. This one, I, I wrote it. And when I came back to it, I was like, I don't even, I don't know how to, this isn't me anymore. It's like a, a skin I left on the ground or something. So, <laughs> Well, it sounds, it sounds like a ritual kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was. Yeah. I mean, uh, you don't have to talk about this because it's, Obviously, I, I know it's annoying to talk about books that you are writing that aren't out yet, but like, what is this like extreme place that you're trying to go to? Is it a place or an idea or a concept? Like, uh, is there anything more you can say about it without giving it away? Man, 
yeah it's it's I, I don't know i just i feel like the book is such a young medium and i feel like we've fallen into a lot of like ideas about it not only because of amazon and 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 twitter but because that's the model we're trained to think is cool like you know you go people want to go get an mfa and, and then they want to know how they get an agent's attention it's like agents aren't in control of art like fuck them like do what you're do what you want to do and i don't know i uh, maybe it's a reaction to this feeling that I that I can't do what I want to do and uh, or uh, so I have to keep like spewing it all right back at itself or something so uh in this in this I was trying to envision a like it's set very far in the future there the time isn't recorded anymore but I tried to go so far out down what I, where I see the world going that uh, I don't know to me uh, to me a lot of my writing feels like a warning it's like I it's not that, you know, I didn't write 300 million, a book where everyone in America kills each other because I want that to happen. Although part, some part of me, some dark part of me probably wouldn't, would say that it does. But like, really, I think we all see where we're headed. We're all looking at the same stuff. We see the same news and we are able to discuss these structures around us that are narrowing our world. And yet we keep walking down the fucking hallway. So like, it's, there's something in me that's screaming, stop it. How do we get out? You know? And so I'm digging the tunnel the only way I I know how or something. I think that's almost a kind of like I guess the term cosmic horror is is overused, but like there is a kind of cosmic horror in this feeling that like knowledge isn't power. You know that like we can go further down the hallway and see where it's going, and yet we just bounce back to like the state of walking down the hallway. <laughs> yeah, because because look, that guy walked down the hallway and he just made it just fine, and people seem to like him and stuff. So that's must or, you know I gotta. You know, and and part of it's a survival thing. Like I have to pay the bills, and I have to survive, and 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 all that. But uh, I don't know. I I just think like I didn't get into writing to survive and pay my bills. I got into writing because it was the one place I could go that there were no limits. And 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 I'm not going to let people put limits on that after all this. You know, and and yeah, you find other ways to do the thing, but like. I don't know if 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 what you want is to be rich and famous and you choose to be an author you are a fool like go be an accountant go go be you know do something if that's what's important if that's the bottom line for you and and, I, and it's a place of privilege for me to be able to say that but I also think like you can make you can make it out uh, that's a DIY thing it's like as a, as a 20 year old I was like I only need fifteen thousand dollars. Well, at the time, it seemed like fifteen thousand dollars would get me through a year. But I don't need. I don't have extravagant wants and needs, so I'm just gonna like do the work I need for money to survive, and then I'm gonna spend as much of my time as I can digging this damn tunnel. You know. So, <laughs> and I think that's the thing that you know, like when you're twenty versus when you're forty. On the one hand, you know, you have to like have different kinds of conversations with yourselves, or think, you know, think in a different way. But almost like the goal of thinking in a different way is trying to remind yourself, like, how do you get back to that first principle? Because like the deepest fear isn't necessarily that the world will make you give up on it, but that some part of yourself will make you give up on it. You know, will turn against the part of you that that you feel is pure and like how to preserve that it is like the, you know, the journey you have to keep like forcing yourself to stay on. Definitely. That's the struggle. I mean, that's why it's so hard to do it every day. It's like really, I'm still just, uh, you know, I, I try not to question. I try the same way that I like, I've run every day for the past 20 years without, uh, with, with a handful of exceptions or exercise. And it's like, I know that if I take my foot off the gas, that, that I don't, the car might stop and I, and, and I'll never start it again. So the, there, it's, it's a blind willingness to like, well, if I am unsuccessful and I become an old miser in my house and no one loves me, like, so fucking be it. At least I did what I thought I wanted to do and there is as a 40 year old versus a 20 year old there is some looking back and regret about opportunities missed in that way to be a human but you know uh you no one's perfect so you do you do what you do you do what you you do what gives meaning to your life and there's maybe no real alternative like it's a kind of false alternative to think that you could choose not to do that right because if you choose not to it's like some some like spirit punishes you in some totally other way I 100% agree. Yeah. When you turn 40, uh, you're like, I mean, at least for me, I, I have a new sense of like time sweating on my back even more than ever. It's like, well, how many more years am I coherent of mind? Um, I better keep, uh, I better keep grinding and, and, and I better really like, you know, 
just getting into conversations with people at this point where I'm like, I'm saying things and I'm like, do I even really believe this anymore? Like, do I really like this, you know, or rereading an old book that from, you know, I love this book when I was 20 and I read it now and I'm like, I needed this when I was 20, but I have nothing to say to it now, you know, we change, we change over time. I think also, you know, you have so much built up over time, like all the things that you've read and written and like all the, you know, notes that you've made and all the effort you've put into it that like every day as time goes on that you don't honor that past self, like you're, you, you know, you're, you're like letting down a, a ever growing accumulation <laughs> of past aspiration. Yeah. In, in a double way where it's like, you're writing with your same bet, but also like, I don't know, to me, to me, it continues to reveal itself in a way where, yeah, things you didn't know had meaning suddenly re reappear in your life and you're like oh my god i i thought that was useless and it ended up changing my entire life like uh you can't know i mean you can't we want to control everything we do we want to know why we're doing what we do and yet when you take your hands off the wheel and some people want to attribute this to god i just call it like life is a mystery and humans are fools i like the smartest human is a fool we still don't know anything about the universe we still don't know anything about existence and like but we sure act like we have it all figured out. And so the more I can pry my little stupid fingers off the wheel and say, like, let something else guide me to a better version of what I think. The more I do that, the more I find pleasure or 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 just, you know, well, I, and it also can that's not to subtract you from the horrors of existence like the greatest horrors of my life has, have occurred. But in the past few years, too, but uh, but. I don't know. It all, it, it keeps rolling. I don't know. I don't know what it is. And it could all, if, if it's all black at the end and that's all you have, well, uh, so be it. <laughs> Just on this, on this train of thought, like, I feel like for the last two years, we've, or at least, you know, from doing this podcast and, and speaking to so many artists and speaking to fans of artists through the show, I feel like so many people found a new, either, form of art or a new work of art or rediscovered something like an old book or a new book or a, I don't know a fucking tv show or a sculpture or a painting I wonder like has there been anything like that for you in the last two years that you came across and recalibrated your thoughts especially after writing a book about someone burning works of fine art <laughs> I'm assuming maybe this like uh, <laughs> your attitudes toward it have changed somewhat you know, it's funny. I've, I was always one of those like, well, I worked all day and then I read for a few hours and now I'm going to watch this Criterion movie. I'm, I, I feel like most of my 20s and 30s were all like, fill me up with all the stuff. Like I want all of it. And like uh, kind of what I was saying earlier, where it's like, I, I don't even I, I'm not even holding it together anymore. So I've been trying to go the the new thing that i've been watching recently is the bachelor you know it's like yeah. um, <laughs> it's 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 like it's like finding uh and, and i watch it in a way where i'm i i have to like talk, tell myself that it's like oh uh just pretend that the bachelor is directed by ryan tricarton and suddenly it's amazing and <laughs> so like um, <laughs> you don't have to pretend very much like i'm a huge fan of 90 day fiance and i uh I've also somehow come around to reality television, which I, I wouldn't say I was ever like against, but it just didn't like very much like what you're saying, like a, a total criterion, like let's, I just want the serious art films. And now I've like, on top of like, what, like becoming like a UFC fanatic, have also just really found like a, <laughs> a, a, a true interest in like examining the human zoo in this way that I'm like, <laughs> seem to be like experiencing it from the outside for the very first time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I need those frames to like tell me that I'm not just wasting my time, but I do think there's something about ob observing people in the, like this is what people watch and like i my, by not having watched this i'm i like it's a weird it's a weird game that that you play but i think you can make that out of anything i really do think that like i've been too selective or 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 i've had enough for now you know like give yourself a break let your brain like breathe and i uh somewhat sometimes i turn i get to the end of a two-hour show like the bachelor and i'm like i need to go like 
scrape my skin off in the shower or something but <laughs> but at the same time like that's what i'm looking for that's yeah, what, you know absolutely. this works even more than guillotine i've read i've read all the bloody disgusting descriptions you can come up with and now i feel really hazed by this stinking show full of weird of weird lame normies you know <laughs> it all comes back around america just keeps giving right it's not done yet (laughs) right see they've taught me to 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 eat of the fruit and i think that i like it uh it's it's working or 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 there's liberation in it i can't tell anymore (laughs) that's so funny you know uh i know we've taken up a, a lot of your time but i just wanted to end end this conversation by saying you know one of the things that i had experienced during this time that really had a huge impact on me. And I haven't, I can't remember the last time I read something online and printed it out, but, and we don't have to talk about this at all, but you had written a piece called Molly. And I have to say it was one of the most like durable and meaningful things I had read in a long time, not just something that I had read online. So all I wanted to say is, you know, thanks for uh, writing that and putting that together. It was, it's really an amazing thing that, um, I urge many people to read. I'll, I'll make sure to link to it in the uh, show notes. But Blake, man, thank you so much for talking with us. This was really a treat. Oh, Paul, thank you so much for saying that about that essay. That's that's. I'm working on a book length version of that essay, sort of like. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that essay was written kind of in a a different mindset about a year ago. But uh, yeah, yeah, I have like a. Hopefully that'll be my next book uh, after this uh, novel, or at least my next nonfiction book. Um, uh, I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, um, yeah, it, it's easily the hardest writing ever, but also like, that's what I'm here for. Like, uh, I think when I be, when I wrote that essay, it was like a, a morning thing and kind of like a shoot, just like I had no choice but to take that opportunity. But then I don't know, the, um, challenging myself to go to the place, you know, uh, I think that was always one of the, the cornerstones of writing to me was like, you know, and this is a Lishian trope or whatever, like, whatever's the worst thing, the most, the thing you can't talk about is what you should be talking about. And that, and that's where I found healing too, is like, I thought I wanted to run away from some of this stuff. And I did like looking into the faces of something like suicide is really hard. And it takes work and and you can't do it at the end of the day and you want to watch the bachelor or whatever but like that's where our healing comes and that's where if we have any way out of this fucked up maze like the conversation needs to go to places like that because mental health is is part of what we're losing in the in this big hole so yeah i appreciate you saying that and yeah